Today is the fourth in a sermon series called Then and Now. And this particular sermon was delivered from this pulpit eight years ago during a most remarkable month in the life of our church. Um, I, I did a special series um, on mental health and mental illness. And in the series, uh, as it was publicized and published in the papers, we had literally more than 100 visitors through the month of August. The church was full most Sundays as people came um, to feel loved in their mental challenges and mental health concerns. And I had um, one man come up to me on the last Sunday and he was there each week and he said to me, um, I won't be back. And he said, but thank you, because these are the only six weeks that I have felt safe in church for most of my life. He said, I won't be back because I don't know for sure that I'll be safe next week. My friends, I just need to say before I start, the church has, church big C, has run away from this question of mental illness and mental health for generations. It's got to stop now. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. So the story of the prodigal son. We know this one, right? We've got this one. We all uh, assume we know it at least. We just assume we know um, this story, like we might assume we know the family living next door, or maybe even the one living under our own roof. And so we leave it left unprodded, unchallenged, uninteresting, and unquestioned. The same could be true of our families too. Let's take another look at this family and I think we might hear stories here that will touch us in our own orbit of life. On the, sur on the surface, Jesus tells a story about three people, a father and his two sons. The older son knows how the world works. He's a classic oldest child, begins life with rookie parents who make all their mistakes on him, and as an oldest son, he has to push against the limits because the limits they set are pretty small as the oldest child, right? He has to learn how to work and he has to grow up faster. He is dutiful, he's hardworking, he is loyal to his father, he's honest, he's everything an Eagle Scout is and more. We think we know him. Now, the older son who knows how the world works is juxtaposed to the younger son who knows how to work the world. He, like many younger children, and uh, for all the young children, for all the, how many of you are youngest children in your family? Come on, let's see your hand. My hand's up because I am too. What I'm about to say may, uh, it, it, I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> so he's like other younger children. He inherits parents who are veterans, right? Actually, we know nothing about the mom but he inherits a dad who's a veteran parent. Like a veteran, dad is tired by doing the work of parenting. This old timer has relaxed quite a bit. The youngest child is inheriting a father who's going through parenting, hopefully for the last time, but as grandparents we know sometimes that's not actually the case. This is the last child to call him daddy. This is the last child who he will help learn to walk and talk and read. And of course, that child will learn even better than the others how to push parental buttons everywhere, buttons everywhere, right? Younger children learn to play their parents like a fiddle. Well, some do, some do, come on. <laughs> and they're good at it, okay? In this story, the younger son is a master fiddler. The master fiddler is hardly working in this story, except to work his daddy. He goes to his father and somehow convinces his father that it's a good idea that the two of them pretend that the father is dead. That's what it means to, to get your inheritance before death, right? 
you have to play pretend, this fictive inheritance. He gets half the property because somehow he rips off his dad convincing him of this. Let's be honest, that was the, not the only way that this guy had done this to his dad before, right? The dad sells half the farm off and the younger son takes off to spend his father's hard worked, hard earned inheritance. It isn't long before the younger son has blown all the inheritance on wild adventures in a faraway land. It says right there that he came to himself. Many translations say he came to his senses and in fact it's written in one of the passages he got his mind back for a moment. Stay with us. This is where we need to do a freeze frame on this story. We need to stop right here. Let's look a lot more closely. On the surface, I've always thought I understood this story perfectly well. But when I came to this passage, considering the family dynamics of mental illness, and I understand those from personal experience, which I'll share, these words jumped off the page of the Bible. So I raise the question for you. Is it possible that the younger son has some sort of brain disease? Is it possible? We can all admit that his behaviors are compulsive, right? A person doesn't beg for, doesn't cajole, doesn't force the hand of a parent for half their value while they're still living and get it. And then go and blow it immediately without something being wrong in their head. Something is wrong in his mind. This is not normal behavior. Can we at least agree on that? One of the problems in dealing firsthand with mental illness is this, that for both the person with the illness and the family and the people around them, there's often a continued ramping up of behaviors. The adult son who pushes his father to give up half the farm pushed his father throughout his lifetime on a lot of things, including family rules and household chores and going to synagogue or church, going to school, and of course, money. He pushes and pushes and pushes until his father finally is pushed against the wall and gives in to the pressure. Through it all, it isn't that he is bad. This is what I believe. It's not that he is bad which his brother keeps saying, it's because he is sick. It's because he is sick. A friend of mine experienced her father going through the end stages of cancer and found that the disease changed his behavior. It changed his brain chemistry. And chemo and radiation and the disease itself made him say things and do things that never were like him before. It didn't fit him throughout her lifetime of knowing him. And in time, she was able to forgive the behavior because it was cancer's effect on her dad. When cancer changes or intensifies and, and, and isolates a person's behavior, we are able to forgive and move on. When brain disorders and brain diseases do the same to our loved ones, it is much harder to move on, even though it's the same grace and the same love extended to one disease that needs to be extended to the other. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to focus on behaviors because I often don't know what I'm talking about. And I don't know or have the words or the medical analysis to name the actions and thus be able to find a way to forgive them. Erratic behaviors related to mental illness haunt the circle of loved ones who wonder, could we have said something different? Could we have done something different? Could we have responded better or sooner? And reacting to things will make everyone crazy. You find yourself hiding things, saying things, lying about things for the first time in your life and you're doing things you never imagined possible, even giving away half of your farm to a child who has not demonstrated in any way that he's stable enough to manage that money you're giving him. You do things like that. I know this personally. 
Now, all this is crazy and crazy making, and it's directly related to crazy in the blood. In her book, Blessed Are the Crazy, Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness, Family, and Church, Sarah Griffin Lund opens her book by defining crazy and crazy in the blood. Crazy, she says, is a slang word which describes a person with brain disease and a description of a situation that has, come, has become out of our control. Crazy in the blood, she says, is a phrase that describes a genetic predisposition to suffering from a brain disease and is the reason some families are more dysfunctional than others. She writes, bipolar tends to run in families and appears to have a genetic link. Like depression and other serious diseases and illnesses, bipolar disorder can, be negatively, can negatively affect spouses, partners, other children, family members, friends, and coworkers. I would like for us to see from now on, if we can, that the younger son is sick. And for once in our lives, not just talk about him as bad. He's crazy, to quote Sarah Lund. He may be suffering from bipolar disease. He may be afflicted with psychosis or suffering from some form of schizophrenia. He may have multiple diagnoses, and we know he's probably drinking on top of all that. We don't know all of that because this is written in the first century, and we're in the 21st century. The words that they had then are words that we, that we, that, that, that they didn't have words then that we have now, right? Nobody had a diagnosis back then. None of these words were in existence. People like the younger son were called hateful names. They were called wayward and wasteful and evil and sinful and a shame on the family name. They were called terrible names and driven as far from the family as possible, living sometimes off the land or in caves. But when we look closely, we see a young man who is not well. There he is wallowing with the pigs, eating the pig food. And I've got to tell you, from the perspective of a religious Jew, which this boy was raised as, this couldn't be worse. This is the worst possible place for him to end up in a pigsty, <clears throat> feeding pigs, eating pig food. Nothing could be worse in his religious background. The clouds part in his brain while he is lying in the pigsty and he wakes up. He comes to his senses, it says, and for a moment he sees his real condition. He has nothing, he has hit rock bottom, and for a moment in time he realizes how low he has fallen. And there, as he's getting the mud of the pigs, the stink of the pigs all over him, as he's wiping his face, as he's trying to stand up in the mud, he starts a mantra. He thinks of home and he says, this is what I will say. I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am not worthy to be called your son. And so he begins saying that over and over and over. He rehearses this all the way home. It's a mantra of madness. Seeking to find home, he turns toward home. He walks by himself. He talks to himself. Like all parents, who have struggled through their children's brain diseases, the father is waiting for his son. Years ago, when my daughter ran away and left her phone on her bed, and she was gone for a week, I never slept. I stood at the window out front with my phone in my hand, waiting for a call. And then one night at midnight, I got a call from Detroit. A bus driver had driven back and forth on his route and seen this person curled up on a bench, freezing. So after he was done his shift, he went back to her got her name, 
She remembered my number, and he said, I have your daughter. I said, I'll come get her. And he said, no, I'm going to bring her home. So he drove through the night and delivered my baby home. I know the story. I have lived this story. Like all parents who've struggled through their children's brain diseases, the father in this story is waiting. His daily prayer is that his boy is still alive. And as bad as his behavior may have become, as often as the father has had thoughts, how he's had to suppress them as best he can just to survive, but he waits. Every night he goes to the edge of the property and any road that leads off the land, he goes to a different entrance to the property every single night and he watches as the sun goes down and he hopes to catch a glimpse of his son in the darkness on the edge of the farm. Every morning, having slept in that place, he rises and starts looking again. He waits for his return. So when we read that the father runs to him, that's not something hard to believe because the father is looking for him to come home. Like this father, my daughter ran away and when she suffered, we waited for her return. And any parent whose child has left home in distress or run away from home has had the same sick, sinking feeling in their hearts. Is she alive? Is someone out there looking after her? Is she dead in a ditch? Is she in a homeless shelter? If so, where, when can I get to her? Or has she found happiness? Has she found sanity somewhere? Has she found a home somewhere, anywhere? Did some other woman or man look into her eyes today and see her hurt and connect that she's mine? And the wandering turns into prayer with the same depth of anguish and concern. And the prayers are lamenting prayers. They are grieving prayers. They are painful prayers. They are prayers that you have when this happens to you. These prayers are wailing cries to God for help. I have prayed these prayers. I know this man. I know what they sound like. I know what they feel like. And finally, when the son reaches what's left of his family farm, his father sees him and runs. Remember, the son has been muttering his mantra of madness under his breath the whole way, getting prepared to lay himself before his father and ask for forgiveness. But he only gets through half of what he's prepared to say when the father stops him and says, quick, get him dressed. Get a robe on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals. He's barefoot. The father says, put sandals on his feet. To which I want to say, you should have started with, give him a bath, right? Get the fattened calf, kill it. We're going to have a celebration because my son was lost and is found. He was dead and he's alive again. I know this man. So the party begins. Grace abounds, love is expressed and spoken, but not so fast. Remember, he has two sons. <laughs> Before we get too excited about the party, let's remember the older son. The older son has been in the fields working all day. He's given yet another hard day's labor for his father. He hears the music, he hears the dancing. I love, he hears dancing. I always think of seeing dancing, but he hears it. He knows something big's going on back at the house. So he comes to the edge of the house, he smells the beef cooking, and he asks one of the servants what's going on. And all I can say is, you know, of all the people in this story, that's the one person I would not want to be, right? Like, uh-oh. <laughs> well, your brothers come home. So your dad's throwing a party. Big brother shares no delight in the return of little brother. His brain fills with visions. He probably goes through PTSD, having grown up with this boy in his home. 
and now he's back, right? His brain fills with all this stuff. All he can see, smell, hear is a future on a smaller estate with this kid that does nothing and gonna mess up the rest of the family farm and their family. In every family, some are blessed not to be crazy in the blood. Big Brother might have gotten the genes that didn't make his mind muddled and his behavior erratic. It is hard to watch his brother come back, watch the cycle begin again. Compassion is in the Big Brother somewhere buried very deep. He has witnessed this pain caused to his father and to him, and he's felt it throughout his life. He sees his brother now living off his inheritance, and he sees his father being played like a fiddle one more time. Big brother is not going in. He has reached the end of his rope. Baby brother has come home, not to penance, but to privilege. It's bad enough that he's wasted his father's estate, but he isn't required to change any of his actions for all the pain he has created. Just welcome home, glad you're here. Oh my goodness, get him everything he needs. One has to wonder, is it possible that he left in the first place because he couldn't watch the success and sanity and normality of his older brother every day? Just saying. But that's not the question to ask big brother. When the older son confronts his dad, the father listens to everything he screams, and he screams. He unleashes the fury that has been inside of him all his life about this boy, this boy become man. He lets his father have it. And his father stands there in the wind tunnel of anger and hate as he lets it all hang out. He's been dutiful, he's been loyal, he's been obedient, he's been as good as anyone can be. He's followed all the orders, he's been faithful, he's done everything right as opposed to everything wrong. And he lets it all out. And dad takes it all in. There's no anger in him. He has no lecture about honoring your father. He has lost his younger son to the affliction of the brain and the misbehaviors of waste. Now he is watching his older son unravel before him, lost in his anger. The father simply does with the older son what he does with the younger son. He loves him. You are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and has been found. Grace abounds for the father for each of his sons. He finds a way to speak to each son Reading the text through the lens of brain diseases and family systems helps us to see that when one of five people is afflicted by a brain disease, the other four members of the family are affected by a brain disease. These may be our children. They may be our siblings. They may be us. As I have struggled with depression through the years, I know it's me in this case. I have also witnessed that sometimes parents forsake the child with the brain disease and circle the wagons around the other kids. I have seen denial of the diseases and disturbing amounts of rejection for the children in need. While that may surprise some of you, it speaks deeply to the difficulties of admitting there are brain diseases in our family system, that there's crazy in our blood. There are other times when the child who appears to be well and is running in his life well or her life well does a shift and leaves instead of the child who left in this story. They do what I call a geographic, right? They leave to create a safe distance from crazy in the blood. Can you see how this works? This complex thing called brain disease and the effects that it has on everyone in the system of the family. The effect of brain diseases on our children is significant. 
Not long ago, I had a conversation with my dear friend Glenn Thomas at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He sent me sobering statistics for Franklin County on mental illness and our children. They're sobering statistics which should grab our attention and almost drive us to do things differently than we've ever done before. 11% of children in Franklin County have or are showing signs of brain diseases at the age of 8 to 11. 8 to 11. By 13 to 18, 22%, that's doubling the number, have shown signs of a mental illness with severe impairments ahead in their lifetime. And this is the scariest statistic of all. Only 50%, 50% of our children and youth with mental health disorders in Franklin County are receiving any, any behavioral treatment at all. 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins at 14, and 75% of all mental illness for a lifetime begins at 24. Those are staggering statistics. Our children need us. They need us to speak for them because nobody else seems to be doing that. We need to look for them coming home. We need to run to them when they make it home. We need to embrace them and support them as best we can while fighting back the pain that we might feel by having a front row seat to see them spiraling. The greatest gift we can give in the struggle against mental illness and brain diseases is to talk about it at church. I preached in a Baptist church yesterday. They worship on Saturday. I preached in a Baptist church yesterday. A woman stood up to give a testimony. She said, I worked as a mental health nurse at Children's Hospital for 40 years, and I never have heard a sermon in church ever about mental illness, ever. She said, thank God for you saying something for the first time in my life. You realize how bad this is? when we in the church hide it from each other, we, we lift the stigma surrounding brain diseases when we talk about it, when we step into it. It's good for our children. It's good for the kids who live, live next door to us. And we need to remember, and this sermon today is dedicated to Natalie Duncan, we need to remember that some of our kids never make it home. They die on the roads. They die in the ditches. They die having taken their lives somewhere where they couldn't get out of the pigsties of their own lives and find a way home. They end their lives through suicide. This happened to my best friend growing up. It happened just 16 days ago to Lori and Ben and their family as Natalie the girl who was your flower girl in your wedding walked down this aisle so many years ago, took her own life. My heart is breaking for you today. Just like the prodigal son, Natalie and my friend Sammy were caught in the parable of madness. Last year alone, more than 50,000 Americans died by suicide and half of them were under the age of 30. That is the most ever in our 248 year history as a nation. But that's not the end of the story. In the power and presence of God's amazing grace, we have to tell our stories. We have to welcome our loved ones home. We have to embrace them with love and grace and let go and let God step into the breach. At 4 a.m. on a cold autumn day, a bus driver from Detroit stepped onto my front steps with my daughter and said, she's home. And you know what she said? She said, I'm sorry, Daddy, please forgive me. And I thought, where did she hear that? She heard that in Luke. But I heard something in Luke, too. I heard, you were lost, but you're found. You were dead, but you're alive. 
Sweetheart, you're home. Welcome home. It's time to finish these stories and find how they end on behalf of those who hurt the most. And as families, to step into the places where we know someone's hurting. And I want you to promise to me that you never call someone bad again. If they're struggling, call it sick. Call it whatever you want, but don't call it bad. Because bad will kill them. Sick can help them find help. So as we do this journey, let us always remember that this is about coming home. Everything. Everything. Everything is about coming home. Amen.